first thing that should be abundantly evident is that I am not Miles, <laughs> but we are still doing church even though he's not here, which I'm sure we're all glad about because we're all here. All right, hey, uh, grab your Bibles real quick, turn to uh, the first letter of John, First John, it's about that far through your Bible, towards the end. We're going to be in chapter 2, we're going to go through two verses, verses 28 and 29. If you need a Bible, can, one of the ushers will give you one. And let's read those together. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Heavenly Father, as we uh, go through your word today, I pray that you would speak to us, Lord, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would give us supernatural wisdom to comprehend your word, Father God, supernatural desire to obey, Father God, so that it wouldn't just be an understanding thing, but it would become a doing thing, Father God, something we'd put into practice. So Lord, we give you this time, pray that you would just bless us like crazy and help us to grow closer to you through study of your word. We pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right, you guys can be seated. That is the last time that I will make you guys stand up before the end of it. How about that? All right, so like I said, I am not Miles, I am Jason. Normally I am next door teaching high schoolers. Some of my former high schoolers are in here. It's always a joy to see them, most of them. Ah, I'm kidding, I love you guys. All right, so we start out this section and the first things he says is, and now little children. So he starts out writing this to little children. John often uses that phrase and we're going to jump right into point number one in your outline so you can get your pens warmed up here. Point number one, children are in a constant try, fail, succeed cycle. We know this from watching children. Funny, we're talking about children on Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, guys, by the way. Um, even in the earliest stages, when they're starting to try to crawl or to walk, we know that there is a try, that there is a fail, um, probably several fails, if not more, before we hit success. Now, this is important because John recognizes this, and we see this also. So as we go through this, remember, children are in a constant try-fail-succeed cycle. We don't expect perfection from children. We do, however, expect and assist in their continued, continued improvement. Make sense? We don't expect perfection from our kids. If we did, we would constantly be disappointed and we'd constantly be upset. I mean, some of us are that way anyway with our kids, but that it's not because we expect perfection. It's somehow we just always expect a little better. You know, I, uh, working with high schoolers, you see that a lot of times where there's, there's a lot of expectations. Perfection should not be one of them because it's a standard we can't live up to. It's a standard they can't live up to. It's a standard no one but Jesus can live up to. So, we don't expect per perfection, but we do expect and assist in continued improvement. We encourage and reward success, and we teach and correct from failure. Um, one thing that we hit repeatedly when I was helping to coach football is that, yes, winning is awesome, but we learn more from our losses than we do from our wins. Because with wins, we're tending to celebrate. With losses, we go through and examine. With failure, we go through and examine. So we know that we're going to have failure because he calls us little children, implying two things, that he loves us like a father and that he understands that we are, in fact, not going to be perfect. Um, one of the phrases that goes around my house continually is that stupid carries its own punishment because quite often when we fail, when we do something stupid, it hurts. Another phrase that goes around is stupid should hurt because it's the only way we learn from it. Um, so we know that we're going to have these same try, fail, succeed cycles in our life as children do. Sometimes we expect ourselves to be better. We expect perfection, but it's not going to be possible. We need to recognize that. The second thing he says after my little children is abide in him. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because John uses this phrase over and over and over. In John's writing, I found it 58 times. Miles says that there, uh, there's like 68 of them. I haven't found the other 10 yet, but I'm not admitting defeat and I'm not admitting to give him success yet, but we'll figure it out. Either way, John uses it a lot. 
Now, if somebody says the same thing to you 58 or 68 times, what does that mean? It means one of two things. Either we're particularly dense and we can't grasp it, or it's really important, or a bit of both. So we see here, this is repeated over and over and over, and it's given to us as an instruction. Because without effort and without intentionality, we will not abide in Christ. Everything about us, where we live, the way we live, our, our flesh in itself wants to draw back from a relationship with God. So if we are not intentional about it, if we are not working towards it, it will fail. It's a lot like a marriage, where if you don't intentionally love your spouse, you will find distance. Same thing with Jesus. If we, don't, if we aren't intentionally abiding in him, we're going to find distance. Uh, the best definition that I found for abide is to maintain unbroken fellowship with someone, which I think is about perfect for the idea of abide, is to maintain that unbroken fellowship. We maintain an unbroken fellowship, or we try to, with Jesus, who remains in perfect unbroken fellowship with God the Father. We read this all over in John chapter 15, 16, 17 there, as Jesus is talking about, Lord, I pray that you would make them one as we are one, talking about his disciples, talking about, by extension, us. Um, we should have this unbroken fellowship with Jesus that comes from abiding in him. Abiding with the idea of kind of like having a lifeline or holding on to your lifeline. Um, when we were in Mozambique in 2014, um, Mozambique was a kind of a crazy place. Sixth poorest nation on the planet, a lot of poverty, a lot of poverty, a lot of craziness, and then you have to be a little crazy to minister there, which is why Luke is perfect for it. If you ever have a chance to go see Luke in Mozambique, it's always exciting. Um, we went on a trip, and uh, we were there. We were doing some ministry on an island. It's like the poorest place in Mozambique, and being an island, you got to take a boat to get there. Being Mozambique, the boat we took was barely a boat. Um, one person's job the whole time was just to run this little pump to pump the water out of the boat back into the ocean because the ocean kept coming in the boat. Um, not a good option for boats, but it's, it's what was there, so it's what we used. So uh, um, we left the island way late, and it was getting dark, and the problem is Mozambique does not have a lot of electrical supply, so there's very few lights. And we know that we're trying to get to the south of the one light we can see but Mozambique also has this ridiculously beautiful, long, shallow shoreline. And the only way to get to the shore is in these, these channels. Well, at night, you can't see those channels. So we're doing a lot of navigation by Braille, where we're bumping, and then you're like, okay, we got to go this way. Oh, nope, can't go there. And so we hit at one sandbar, and we had to get out, and we had to push the boat. So we're out there, and we're pushing the boat. And then all of a sudden, it drops off because we're in another one of those channels. And I go to jump on the boat, and I stepped on something, and like I pulled back, so I, and then all of a sudden, we're in the water, and the boat is going, and nobody realizes that I'm not in the boat. And I'm hanging on the side of this boat, and you better believe, there was, there was an abiding relationship <laughs> between me and the boat. I was clinging desperately to the boat, and I finally was able to throw my heel up and lever myself over, and I was like, oh, where were you? I was like, water? <laughs> we got to hold on to Jesus like that. We've got to abide in Christ like that because if we don't, even our own flesh wants to pull us away, not to mention the fact that we have a serious enemy in Satan who's also trying to do the same thing, to push us away from Jesus. Often, though, we don't fully realize the need that we have to abide in Christ until we see one or both of two things. First of all, the danger or consequences of not abiding in Christ. When we see that, that one's usually easy to see in other people's lives, where you're watching it and you're going, oh, that's not going to be good. That's not going to be good. It's like YouTube. You know, Most of YouTube is built on that, where you're like, oh, that's not going to be good. That's, oh, yep, yeah, that wasn't good. Bicycle tricks, it's funny, especially with Garrett. That was a great one. Um, but when you're watching somebody's life and you watch their life implode because they're not abiding with Christ, that should trigger that in our mind, like, wow, I need to, I need to stay close to Jesus because I don't want to have that happen in my life. Or another thing we see is that our own complete inability to bear fruit or sometimes even maintain and function on our own. And we can see this through circumstances that happen to us. We can see it through relationships, things like that, where we realize without Christ, I can't function in this. 
It was something like that that brought me to Jesus, watching God work in somebody else's life, going, man, I, could not, I couldn't function with that. I knew they had something I didn't. So often we see circumstances that we can't handle, and it, it lets us know it's that, that little flag in our mind that says, no, no, you need to abide in Christ. You need to get back to Jesus. Um, that's often why we see people turn to Jesus in times of crisis. When we saw, like after 9-11... We saw churches full to the brim with people because they're watching something, they're seeing something that they cannot handle. There's, I, I, don't, I can't fix this. Where do I go to answers for something I can't fix? And so very often they come to Jesus. That's why it's important that we abide in him. The next phrase that we see in these verses where it says, and now little children abide in him so that when he appears. Now when he appears, that's a promise. Not a threat. Sometimes we tend to hear it as that. It's, it's a promise. It's not a threat. It's a promise that we see in John chapter 14, verse 3. It says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now, depending on how we see this, how we hear this, we can see it two different ways, especially on Father's Day as we think about our view of fathers, of fatherhood, what it means to be a father, what it means to have a father. Um, if you had a a good father, you'll hear this kind of in the light of, I'll be home soon, and there's excitement, and there's joy, and it's like, oh, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. If you maybe have a, not a great relationship with your dad, sometimes you hear this more along the lines of, just wait until your father gets home. That's not what God is saying. God's not saying, you better wait, I'm going to be there in a minute, and we're going to have a discussion, mister. That's not what he's saying here. We can be confident when he appears. This is a promise. He is going to come back. He is going to rescue us. Now, and it says the next phrase, when he appears, we may have confidence. Point number two in your outline. It is possible to have confidence in his appearing if we are, ab if we are abiding in him. If we're abiding in Christ, we can have confidence when he shows up. but it's only through abiding in Christ. And abiding requires submitting to God's authority and working towards God's purpose. We can't abide in Christ and then live contrary to what Christ calls us to do. It doesn't work that way. So we need to be working towards God's purpose in God's authority, submitted to God's authority. Abiding in Christ will bring us confidence, not confidence in us, because if we're honest, any of us can look at ourselves and say, yeah, I'm not confident that I can, I can function like this for very long. Our confidence is in him. Our confidence is not in our own abilities. Our confidence is in Jesus, in God, because he is perfect. We can trust him. We know we're not perfect. And we become a child bringing home an art project. We probably, if you're a parent, you've had those moments where your kid brings you an art project and you're like, that is so great. That is such an awesome, it's a horse. Oh, that's a great horse. I had it upside down. I could totally see, no, it was right side up. Okay, um, yeah, that's awesome. I'm gonna put that somewhere special. And you, know, you have those moments where it's like, I, I'm not quite sure what this was, but they are excited to bring it to me. I'm convinced that my life has a lot of moments like that where it's like, God, look what I did. And he's like, that's a great horse, I think. <laughs> but we become that child because we realize that he is a good father. We, become a, we bring things to him like a child bringing home an art project, not like a child trying to hide a bad report card. Because so I've had those moments too where you try to hide your report card because you know you're going to be in trouble for it. That's not who God is. So we abide in Christ that brings us confidence in him, not in us, and abiding allows pruning in our life. Now, this is always a fun subject. I was having a long conversation with somebody recently about pruning because God was doing some significant pruning in their life, stemming from their own poor decisions, but... He was pruning off a lot of stuff. Well, pruning indicates, pruning in our life indicates a plan and a path to increase quantity or quality of fruit in our life. God prunes us because he wants better and more fruit out of us. So sometimes he takes things away from us that are not even bad things, but it's because he has a plan and a path to something that's even better. So there's 
when we have confidence in him, it allows him to prune because abiding allows that pruning. An increase in fruit of either quantity or quality in your life brings glory to God and joy to us, to the plant and to the gardener. Um, case in point, um, a couple of years ago, uh, Pastor Mark, um, they wanted a tangelo tree. So they bought a tree, they named it Angelo the Tangelo, they planted it in the yard, and it was like, you know, there was this whole, like, it's brand new. We moved onto our property, and it already had fruit trees, so I didn't get to go through the infancy stage of it, but, you know, so they bought the tree, they planted the tree, and there was the, the repeated saga of Angelo the Tangelo, and I don't know how it's doing, it got a little bit, and then Angelo the Tangelo is producing a great amount of fruit. Like, they have great Tangelos, there's a lot of them. Um, if you want to try one, just ask Mark, He'll probably, he might bring you one, or he might not. It's up to, you know, up to him. But it is a testament to both the tree, to Angelo, but also to the gardener, which in all fairness is probably more missy than Mark, but it brings glory to the tree and to the gardener. The same thing in our life. When we produce good fruit, it brings glory to us and greater glory to God. And we know this because when we're doing what God has called us to do, people around us notice that. And the hallmark of Christianity, the number one fruit that we are called to produce is love. And when we produce love, that is attractive to the people around us. And another thing that abiding does is it leads to successful reproduction. The purpose of fruit is to replicate the plant that it came from, right? That's why apples look good, because the apple, the design is that you take the apple, enjoy the apple, and then the seeds go somewhere else and you grow another apple. Well, the same thing happens with us. The, the fruit that we are called to bear is designed so that we would replicate the tree that we're attached to. We are called to replicate, make other believers. That's what we're called to do. So abiding leads to successful reproduction. Successful reproduction is a sign of a healthy plant. Now, when we have healthy fruit production in our lives, that's a sign of spiritual health. The same way that good fruit is a sign of a healthy plant. And spiritual health brings confidence. And we may have confidence. That's the section we're talking about. Have confidence. And the next phrase, not shrink from him in shame. Point number three in your outline. Shame is an identity. Guilt is a legal designation. This is a very important point. Um, our culture is, uh, has a very interesting relationship with shame. You know, we're told that we're not supposed to shame anybody for anything and there's all these different things. And it's important that we have an understanding and a, a definition of terms as we talk about this. Guilt is a legal designation as in you did something wrong. If you committed a crime, you are guilty. That is a legal designation. Shame is an identity where it says, you know, guilt is you did something wrong. Shame says I am something wrong. And there's a total difference there. So, guilt, and I, I, as I was putting this together, I was actually uh, talking to a counselor friend of mine who does all kinds of clinical counseling, and it was interesting as we were bouncing this off because a lot of this stuff I got directly from her, so if it you know, gives, causes you all kinds of distress, I'll give you her number and you can talk to her, it'll be great. Probably do some really good, too. She's a great counselor. Anyway, <laughs> guilt is a gift. Guilt is a gift from God because guilt is a sign that you have a functioning moral compass. If you never feel guilty for anything, it's not because you're perfect. It's because you don't have a functioning moral compass, which makes you somewhat of a sociopath, which is not a great thing. Um, but a guilt is a gift. It's a sign that you have a functioning moral compass. Guilt calls us to change. Guilt is what inspires us to do things differently. When we know that we're guilty, it's like, oh, I, I, need to, I need to not do that thing again because that was not a good thing. And so I go and I do something different. Guilt indicates for the believer that you are still connected in some way to the vine. There is still some connection there. Now, shame, on the other hand, is a curse. Now, as I was looking into shame stuff, it was really interesting because there's two, basically two types of shame. Um, depending on who you read. If you read some people, they'll break it down into all kinds of... But you break it down into two basic categories. Shame over something that you have done or shame over something that has been done to you. 
So shame over something that you have done is that I know I've done something wrong and now I cannot ever be right. I did something that was so horrible that I know that I can never, no, I, I just, I, God is never going to love me. I can't do, and we, we end up inhabiting this shame and it ends up becoming a part of who we are and it attacks our identity in Christ. We feel guilt, but instead of being freed from guilt through the love of our Savior, we end up embracing it and it makes a home in us. Sometimes we end up feeling guilty or we don't feel guilty or we feel, or we, sorry, let me rephrase this. Sometimes we feel guilty, but we won't get rid of it because we refuse to admit that what we did was wrong. Sometimes we're so sure that we're right, even though we understand, we know deep down that we weren't, that we can't get rid of that shame because we won't admit that there was anything that was wrong. Part of the process of relieving guilt and removing shame is the actual admitting that, you know, I did something wrong and I need to repent from it. Now, the second kind of shame, shame from something that's been done to us is much, much more insidious. You see this usually in people that have had some sort of early childhood trauma or abuse where instead of shame over something that I've done, now it's shame that's been given to me by somebody else and what they did. And it's much harder to get rid of because usually it's attached to something that we cannot talk to people about or we will not talk to people about or we know that if we talk to people about it, it's just going to be terrible. It's never, they're never going to look at me the same. It's going to be horrible. It's very insidious. Um, shame is an attack on our identity in Christ. Shame says you can't be a child of God because of this. God's not going to want you because of what you did or because what you allowed to happen or all these different things. Shame is a direct attack on our identity in Christ, and shame leads to separation from God and others. When we feel shame, we pull back because we don't want to expose our shame. This is the difference between shame and guilt. When we have guilt, we can say, okay, you know what? I feel guilty. I shouldn't have done that. I repent. Shame pulls me back away from everybody else, and I end up hiding it. I end up separated from everybody. Um, the best way that I can describe this, um, in John chapter 15, Jesus talks about, I am the vine and you are the branches. Um, we've been going through this in the high school room. We've been in the, the farewell discourse here in John for quite a while. We'll probably be in there for quite a while yet. It's so full of good stuff. But in John 15, where he talks about, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, shame separates us from Jesus, and all of a sudden, instead of being apart, we're separate. Instead of being connected with Jesus, now we're separate. And the thing is, that takes us from being a branch to being a stick. A branch can produce fruit, but the only thing a stick can grow is fungus. And so what ends up happening is the shame is like this fungus that just grows on us and grows on us. It leads us to withdraw from authentic relationship it kills truth because we're, we're meditating, we're, we're making a pattern of, of lying and hiding. Shame believes the lie that you have to be good enough to merit a relationship with Jesus. When we know that we're never going to be good enough, that's why he died for us. Shame ends up in idolatry because we find our identity in what we've done or what was done to us instead of in Christ. And all of a sudden we've made our shame into an idol. To combat shame, we have to do the same thing that is most effective in combating a fungus. Sunlight. Fungus does not grow well in sunlight. For us, spiritual shame, you got to bring it into the light. It has to be exposed to light. The longer that it's covered, the worse it's going to get. We need to bring real light and openness to our relationships. We need to be willing to be honest with each other especially as our relationships are founded in Jesus. It's part of the abiding. It's part of having that connection with Jesus. Jesus said he's the vine. He is the trunk, singular. We are the branches, plural. A tree with one branch is not a very good tree. But see, a tree has many branches because it takes many branches to produce good fruit. We cannot succeed on our own. We cannot have true fellowship with God if we can't have fellowship with each other. Part of fellowship is being open and honest. So when we're carrying shame that we're, not hide, that we're hiding, that we're not exposing to the light, it's not going to go away. We have to 
Expose that to the light of Jesus. Shame is a burden that is too big for us to carry alone. You'll never be able to carry, it'll never, it'll never last. It just gets heavier and heavier. We are called to live together and to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's the only way we're going to get rid of shame. So give it to Jesus and let others help you unload your burden. The next phrase that we cover in these verses, do not shrink from shame in his coming, if you know that he is righteous. Now the question is, do we know that Jesus is righteous? Do we know that God is righteous? Absolutely we do. Do we truly believe it? The word here in the Greek for know means no. It means to know. We have to know that he is righteous. Do you leave your cares and concerns with him because he is righteous and you can trust him or do you carry them with you? Does the branch decide where the tree is going to grow? No, that's determined on the trunk. But so often we, we want to maintain control of that. Well, I'm going to go here and I'm going to do this and I'm going to go here and I'm going to do this. And very often when we are headstrong and we're deciding that what we're going to do, that pulls us away and all of a sudden we go from Branchville and we're living in Sticktown and we're not producing fruit. Does the clay thwart the hands of the potter? Clay does what the potter wants. Can the branch overthrow the trunk for its own purposes? No, the branch does not survive without the trunk. Is God your trust or is it in your own performance? See, sometimes it's very easy to get the two things mixed up because we'll measure our performance on how well we think we're doing in producing fruit. Oh, well, uh, I, did, I talked to this person and I did this and I did this and I did this and I did all these things. And we get up in that whole Mary and Martha thing where Martha's working very hard doing all this stuff. And Jesus says, but Mary's chosen the better way. She's sitting at my feet. Sometimes the best way for us to bear fruit is to stop trying to bear fruit and spend time with Jesus. So is, is God your trust or is it in your performance or your spouse's performance or your children's performance or your finances or career or any of these things outside of God alone that end up intruding as our management, as our measurement for how we're doing? See, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, it said, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Part of abiding is finding rest. We're clinging to him like a lifeline but we need to remember that we're clinging to the hands of a father who is stronger than us. Now, if we were in the high school room or youth ministry thing, we might illustrate this by having, you know, a leader grab a kid and start spinning in circles and say, okay, now I'm going to let go and you have to hold on. And they'll spiral off into the side of the room and somebody will get hurt and then we'll get phone calls so we wouldn't do that. But <laughs> that would be part of the thought process. We need to remember that the abiding is a two-way street. It's not just me holding on to him, but it's me holding on to the hand of my father who's stronger than I that can hold on back. So it's not dependent on my performance. It's dependent on him. And it says the next phrase, you may be sure. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure. We can have complete trust. We can have trust free from worry or fear. It's a side effect of abiding in Christ. We learn to trust because we know that he is righteous. If he is righteous and I am his, I can trust him. But what about when I screw up, however I want to call it, whether it's sin or moral failure or I slipped up or I did something stupid, however I want to call it, what about that? What happens when I do those things? Hold on to that thought. Because the next phrase is, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness. Now, it's important that we look at the word choice here. Because the word choice is, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness. See, God is righteous, but we practice righteousness. It's a total different thing. God is righteous, it's who he is. We practice righteousness. Another way to say it is we do righteousness. Um, Romans chapter 3, verse 10, as is written, says, none is righteous, no, not one. Point four, we are not righteous we do righteousness. 
See, like Nike, we're called to do it. Guys often, when we, when we greet each other, we'll say, you know, we'll get the, uh, the name out of the way. Hey, how you doing? And then our next question is normally, so what do you do? Which means, what's your job? What's your function? And very often, um, we tend to uh, define ourselves by what we do. Now, our job is not who we are, right? There's a lot more to you than your job. There's a lot more to me than my job. It's very different. But we tend to boil it down to that sometimes. Well, if we find our identity in anything other than Jesus, we're demeaning ourselves and we're demeaning our Savior. Our identity is in Christ. I hate telling people what my job is because it kills conversation immediately. <laughs> when you talk to somebody and you're just like at the barber shop or something, like, oh, what do you do? It's like, oh, well, I, I, I work with kids. Oh, yeah, well, what, 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 I work at a nonprofit with kids. Oh, really? So what is that? I'm a youth pastor. <laughs> conversation dies. Oh, well, you know, I, uh, I got uh, I, I to go back to church sometime. <laughs> and then it's, it's over. And all of a sudden, we don't have authentic communication anymore because the whole idea is that, oh, well, all of a sudden, you're on this plane and I'm over here. But see, my identity is not in my job. My identity is I'm a child of God, which is important because being a child of God does not change on my performance and my duty. If we're handing out evaluation forms and you're leaving here and like, that was an F, that was an F, that was an <laughs> underlined F, that's not my identity. My identity is a child of God, not dependent on what I've done that day. Because he's my father and he loves me. So I hate when we boil it down to what we do. We've got to find our identity in Christ. And remember, this whole section here, these two verses, were written to little children. Little children, as we know, are in a constant try, fail, succeed cycle. He understands that about us. That's why we are not righteous as God is righteous, but we do righteousness because God empowers us to do it. We are recipients of an imputed righteousness. We are given righteousness through the blood of Jesus Christ. So God sees us and says, oh, they're righteous. Not because we are, but because Jesus was. This should bring us comfort because it allows us to practice righteousness. It allows us to do the right thing even though we're not perfect. So when we practice righteousness, a term for practicing righteousness, uh, for me, it's just where we're bearing fruit. We're bearing fruit, the fruit that God's called us to bear, to bear, fruit of the Spirit. When branches bear fruit, what does a gardener do? Prunes them. John chapter 15, verse 2, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So that tells us that we're not at the end, we're not perfected, we're not without something else that can be done to us at any point in our existence. That's why Paul could look back and say, I am the chiefest of sinners. Because as God is faithfully pruning things from him, he can look back and say, okay, well, that, he took that away. We are not who we're going to be. Because God is not done pruning us. So as we bear fruit, God will prune. And the thing is, he doesn't always prune bad things. Sometimes he prunes good things because he wants us to produce better fruit. So sometimes we have to say goodbye to things that are not bad. They're just not the best way for us to produce fruit. So the branch that produces fruit is not perfect because the pruning will continue to happen. Now, it says that everyone who practices righteousness, in that phrase, we are not alone. We are part of everyone. We are part of the everyone of people that follow Jesus. We are part of the people who are practicing righteousness. We are one body with many parts. That should sound familiar to you if you're any kind of Bible scholar. When one part suffers, we all hurt. Now, um, this last Wednesday, we did our first fun in the sun of the year. We started at 5 o'clock. We have... You know, we serve dinner to the kids. We do all kinds of fun stuff. It's for junior high and high school. We hang out. We have a great time. Um, it is not without an occasional blip. <laughs> um, so Wednesday, we're out there, and we're having a good time. We're getting ready for, to start the games, and, you know, we've got people barbecuing over here. And um, one of the young men in the group was drinking out of his water bottle, and somebody else in the group, who we're not quite sure of, which is probably good, because then they'd get blamed for it, um, He's drinking and somebody else chucked a basketball up. 
and the basketball hit the bottom of the water bottle, the top of the water bottle hit the lip, and the lip gets split. Now, it was, it was pretty interesting because when you first look at it, it's not a big deal. You're like, oh, it doesn't look too bad. And he says, good. And when he said good, it was like a clam. And it opened up and it was like, ooh, okay, not good. Never mind. So I called his dad and we went through the whole process again where he's like, I sent him a picture. He goes, well, send me a picture. And he's like, that doesn't look so bad. I said, yeah, but when he moves his lip, his, it opens. And he's like, oh, okay. And he said, well, if it was your kid, what would you do? And I said, well, if it was my kid, I'd probably take him in the other room and super glue it. But that's because it's my kid and not your kid. I'm not going to do that for your kid. You... So he took his son in, got a couple stitches. And when he got the stitches, his first question he asked was, can we go back now? Can we go back now? So the whole point of this is that when he got whacked in the face, it wasn't just his face that was affected. It was all of him. It wasn't like we could send his lip out to be stitched and he still had fellowship. It affected every part of him. The same thing for us. We are one body. When one of us is hurting, it's not that it's just like, oh, well, that person's hurting. That's a bummer. We're one body. That affects us whether we realize it or whether we admit it or not. When I'm struggling, especially if I'm holding on to hidden shame, it's affecting everything else. It's affecting everybody else. We're part of everybody. We are one body. We should be so invested in the success of the body that it's readily evident to those around us. This means, if we do this right, that we're going to be full of love. Not like Disney fake love, follow your heart stuff. Um, I like Disneyland. I'm not a huge fan of Disney. Um, Little Mermaid. The Disney Little Mermaid is a story about a girl who gets snotty with her dad, does what she wants, and gets rewarded at the end. The original Hans Christian Andersen Little Mermaid is a completely different story. It's about a girl who makes a mistake, and then to save the person that she loves, she gives up her own life. Two radically different stories. One's a beautiful story of self-sacrifice. The other one is a snotty kid who gets to win at the end. It's, it's not the same love. This is totally different. Um, when we have that kind of love, it's, it's going to be messy. It's going to be inconvenient. It's going to wreck our schedules. It's going to affect our lives. It, it involves blood, sweat, and tears, spiritually and sometimes actually literally. We should be so full of grace that sinners find comfort around us and Pharisees get freaked out. Because that's what happened with Jesus. We should be those kind of people. We should be so full of joy that we can face trials knowing that we are not going to be crushed. We should have such confidence in our Father that it's like, I know this is terrible. And maybe in the moment, well, all we can do is just sit in his lap and cry. But we know that he's not going to let us go. We should be so full of peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, all these things, all the fruits of the Spirit, that should be the hallmarks of our life. And I guarantee you, with a list, the same thing's going to happen to you that happens to me, where you look at it and you're like, you know, I'm not so good at that. Yes, we're going to find places for us to improve. But remember, we're called to bear fruit and do righteousness, not bear fruit and be perfect. Abide in Christ and you're going to see an improvement in the quantity and the quality of fruit that you bear in your life. The last portion there. If you, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. It's a cycle. Who is born of Jesus? His little children. Little children who inhabit a series of try, fail, succeed cycles. But we're born of him. We are born of Jesus. If you are abiding in Christ, the worship team is going to come up and we're going to close in just a minute. But if you are abiding in Christ, if you are born of Christ, you can rest in the goodness of your Savior today. You can rest in the fact that my God loves me, my God's got me, and I can give up any guilt and any shame that I've been carrying him. You can lay down your shame with confidence in him because our confidence is not in us. If today you don't know Jesus, you can it's not a difficult process. You don't have to be good enough because you're never going to be good enough. But he's good enough that he can pay for our sin. If I pay for my sin, 
I'm just paying my own bill and it buys me nothing. But see, Jesus paid for my sin and defeated death that I can be freed from it. And I can have eternal life with him. So if you don't know Jesus, you can know him. You can walk away from here today knowing that there is no sin and no shame left for you. So we're going to worship together. Thank you.